Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about seven times the Pawn Stars got swindled. If you're a fan of Pawn Stars, make sure you leave a like on the video and also make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be notified when we release our daily videos. And now, with all that being said, let's get right into the video. Number one, Peter Max paintings. The Grammys and a host of other things. His work has been known to sell for over $100,000. If this thing is real, it'll be a great item in my shop. So you want Paintings are pretty much a common place in pawn shops due to some being worth thousands of dollars to even millions. In this case, a painting done by Peter Max, a German-American artist who is well known for his colorful pop art paintings. This isn't too bad until you hear the fact that his paintings can be sold for well over $100,000. Well, for a customer named Willie, he came into Rick Harrison's gold and silver pawn shop in 2010 with a Statue of Liberty painting done by Peter Max. You're probably expecting him to get paid pretty well for this painting, but you'd pretty much be dead wrong. Harrison immediately called in an expert to check if the painting was real in the first place. No surprise, the painting was indeed real. The painting was valued at $50,000 in an art gallery. Willie's intentions for the painting was to sell it off so he can invest the money into his business. The shocking part was when Willie asked for a starting price of $35,000, then Rick countered with $10,000, and they kept going for a while until it was left off at $12,000, which in this case is an utter steal. Due to this, I really I hope that Willie's business doesn't have to do anything with negotiation because he's probably losing millions at this point. Rick literally left like a bandit, taking the painting for even less than a quarter of what it actually is worth. Especially since it's already an expensive one-of-a-kind painting, he was the only winner that actually came out of this. Interesting artist. He's probably the most omnipresent artist you'll find. Uh, his work can be found on the side of cruise ships, on album covers. Number 2. Beach Boys Surfboard um, cowabunga, dude. That's a, <laughs> that is a long board. Yeah, it is. It's an old one, too. Yeah, it is. This is the actual beat. The Beach Boys are a legendary American rock band best known for their songs reflecting California culture, especially surfing. Despite building an image around surfing, only one of the members of the Beach Boys actually knew how to surf, Dennis Wilson. Wilson's own personal surfboard ended up being pictured in two of their iconic album covers, Surfing Safari and Surfer Girl. This surfboard later pops up in a pawn shop with a man named Brian. Brian, who was asking for 100000 for the surfboard, ended up mentioning mentioning that it was recently the focal point of a year-long Beach Boys exhibition in the Los Angeles at the Grammy Museum, where it ended up being insured for $200,000. Rick calls up a buddy of his, who estimates the board is worth around $70,000, saying that the board, if it was signed by all of the members of the Beach Boys, would have been worth a full price of $100,000. Brian just ends up ignoring all of this, sticking to his firm asking price of $100,000. Rick lowballs and offers us up at least $60,000. $5,000, justifying himself by saying that the Beach Boys are quote unquote not as iconic as the Beatles who will be worth the money forever. Brian ends up budging and lowers his price to $75,000, but at this point Rick is just solid with $65,000. They end up with no deal, and the surfboard later ends up listed through Rockway Records on behalf of Brian for a whooping $150,000 day and age that are now over a million dollars big numbers are coming in the rock and roll field but as good as the number three beetle bailey original comic print who we have here i've got a beetle bailey comic strip by artist mort walker beetle bailey yes sir where in the world did you get this? I believe it or not, I got this. Beetle Bailey was a humorous comic strip created by the artist of Mort Walker in 1950 as a way to depict the life of a military draftee. Harold, a man who obtained multiple Beetle Bailey comic strips by trading his hunting dog to an old man in Kansas who comes into the pawn shop seeking $400 for his comics. Rick only decides to offer up a merely $75. He ends up mentioning the lack of rarity of the comic, saying, There was thousands of newspapers so they really weren't worth that much money at all. Harold is visibly offended by Rick's offer, but he still drops his asking price down to $250. Rick again mentions the lack of value in the comic strips, saying that it isn't the original art. The original art would be worth a lot more money. The two ended up agreeing on an asking price of $100. It's only safe to say the person who ended up with the best deal out of all of this was the man from Kansas who ended up getting a hunting dog out of all of this by trading the $100 worth of old comic strips. Come on over here, I'll do some paperwork with you. I settled on hundred dollars because as he pointed out, there's quite a few in circulation and hundreds better than nothing. Number four, the Godfather autographed script. 
This is the Ghostbusters proton pack. This is a replica that I built myself. Ghostbusters was a big budget movie for its day. Widely regarded as one of the greatest films of all time, The Godfather was an instant hit when it released in 1972. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola and starring Marlon Bucks, when a customer called Denise enters Rick's shop with a manuscript simply signed by Al, everyone assumes it's Al Pacino's autograph. Rick calls up his expert buddy who verifies that it is indeed a real autograph from Al Pacino, which values the manuscript at a couple thousand dollars. Danny ends up asking for at least a thousand, and Rick counter offers for 500. Nothing can relatively be done about this price due to the fact that it is not the original script. Unlike The Godfather, this turned out to be an offer you could refuse, since Danny ended up passing on Rick's offer, especially since it was lowballed so much. It was later discovered that the signature on the script was not actually Al Pacino's, but it actually had been Al Ruddy, a producer on the movie. But even after this revelation, Danny was still able to sell the screenplay for well over $12,000 at an auction. This is one example where Rick saved himself from overpaying on a bad item. Proton beam, so when you press this button, it fires. I'd like to get at least $2,000 for it. Number 5, Medieval Mace. It's you again. What do we have? Well, obviously it's a mace. Uh, put that down gently. <laughs> Will do. Okay, do you know in a season 9 episode of Pawn Stars, a customer named Davis comes into the shop with a medieval mace. These weapons were often used by soldiers in the Middle Ages, and although it only weighs about 5 to 6 pounds, it carries a thousand pounds of force. It's actually equivalent to a bullet hitting someone in the head. Rick ends up confessing to loving having items like this in the shop since they attract weapons collectors as well as regular men just looking for something cool. Rick calls in an expert in military antiques who confirms that the weapon was made around the 1500s and really isn't just some old replica. The expert ends up valuing the mace at around $2,500, which means it's $1,000 less than Davis's original asking price of $3,500. Rick offers $1,500, but Davis is certain that the mace is worth more than the counter offer, and the counter offer to that was $2,900. After a bit more back and forth, Davis finally agrees on one offer. The deal was $2,100. It is safe to say that Rick will have no trouble making a profit off of this item, since they usually sell for about four thousand dollars i would place this 1500s this is a weapon not a wall hanger and that's what you want number six batman utility belt hello hello i brought in my official batman utility belt from 1966 Purdy. The live-action Batman television series started in 1966 starring Adam West was only aired for around three seasons, yet it ended up spawning a wave of toys including a Batman robot, Batcopter, and of course the Batman utility belt seen on in season 15. A woman by the name of Karen who claimed to have bought the Batman utility belt at an antique auction shop in the 70s. She came into the shop looking to sell it for $17,000. Rick ended up bringing in a toy expert who says that the toy to toy collectors, this is the holy grail. Karen's utility belt was actually in incredible shape, having never been removed from its original packaging. And it still contains all the original parts, including the battering, bat cuffs, and bat gun. And you can't forget the bat rocket grenade. Rick's expert ends up valuing the belt at $16,000. But Rick ends up only offering about $10,000 in the end. Karen unsuccessfully tries to get Rick back up to $15,000. But Rick ends up on a firm $11,000 at the highest. Karen ends up making two more attempts at a higher amount, but she eventually agrees on $11,000. This Batman utility belt definitely can't miss on the market considering that tons of Batman and superhero collectors are out there. Okay. All right, deal. Sweet. Chum will meet you right over there and do some paperwork with you and get you paid. Okay, and no, okay. don't touch. You're not going to touch it. Number seven, Houdini's straight jacket. Antique straight jacket. For like crazy people kind of straight jacket? Well, this is not just any straight jacket. This is an original Harry Houdini straight jacket. Okay, it does look. Harry Houdini is one of the most famous magicians and escape artists well known for his spectacular and sensational escape acts, notably those involving a straight jacket. Houdini's first performance, a straight jacket escape in 1899, which ended up catapulting him to fame. A man named William came into the pawn shop with what he claimed to be one of Houdini's original straight jackets. 
Yes. He tried selling it for a, a, about $100,000. Rick brings in a magician and magic historian named Murphy who mentions that trying to simply prove that the straitjacket indeed belonged to Houdini is like one in a million. And if it is real, it's like the holy grail to magicians. Despite the slim chance, Murphy is able to confirm that the jacket did in fact belong to the great Harry Houdini by authenticating it with photographs of Houdini wearing the straight jacket in January 1st, 1915 in St. Louis, Missouri. The expert ends up valuing the jacket in around $34,000 to $42,000, a seemingly bidding price for such an iconic piece in the magic community. Rick, however, offers William less than half of the expert's estimate, only offering a mere $15,000. William tremendously drops his asking price from $100,000 to $40,000. Rick is still not satisfied with the asking price, but he does raise his offer to $25,000. Rick tries to justify his lowball offer, saying that it could be years before he sells the jacket, and that the jacket is already well over 100 years old. Not only that, it's already in rough shape. Both men end up disagreeing with $25,000, William asking $30,000, and Rick leaving it at $25,000 being the most he would pay for it. William ultimately passes on the deal and leaves Rick regretting it as he admits that he really wanted the jacket and felt like running after William in the parking lot. Okay. I'm always here, man. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Right, thank you. Forget the numbers, the most exciting thing is to actually have uh, the expert come in and find an actual- Well thanks for watching today's video on 7 times pawn shop got swindled. If you guys did like the video, make sure to drop a like and comment saying which choice was your favorite throughout the list. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be notified when we release our daily videos. And from all of us here at the channel, have a great day.